Thank you for joining me as I talk about lies women believe about marriage. My sister is an artist and I love her paintings because she can see things that I don't necessarily see. Like when we were in college, I got to watch her paint and she would be looking at something like a tree and I would be looking at the tree and then she would choose a color to put as a part of this tree that I hadn't really thought about being tree-like. And then when I looked at what she was seeing, I could see that color too. And so the way that her eye painted a picture, it helped me look at the tree in a different way and to see different aspects about the color and composition because of how she was seeing it in the picture that she was painting. Marriage exists for a very similar purpose. That marriage is intended to tell us things about God, to paint a picture about our relationship with Him, and to help us see different things than we would have seen otherwise. And that is the glorious use that God has for marriage in our world. Now, because it has such a fantastic message and such a fantastic goal, this is something that, that Satan would really like to disrupt. He would really be into, you know, stopping it and stopping marriage from being something that spreads the truth about God into the world. And because of that, he puts a lot of effort into disrupting marriage and the beauty that is in marriage. And so we're going to be talking about six different lies that women believe about marriage. The first one is that I have to have a husband to be happy. Now, this is a big red flag for me anyway, because first off, if your goal is to be happy, you are never going to achieve it. Happiness is one of those things that can never be grasped if it is our goal. It's always something that comes along as an auxiliary to another goal that we have. And so if you are looking for happiness out of marriage, you're going to be sadly disappointed because marriage isn't about happiness. The goal of marriage isn't to be happy. It's for us to learn things about God and understand something different about God. This is a super fantastic mystery because in marriage, two, two beings that are completely other are united as one and they become something that is one. And so in marriage, we get a chance to really and truly relate with someone who is other than us. And this is so very important because God is so very other than humans. He's not a human. He doesn't think like a human. He doesn't act the way humans think we act. And this is the picture that God is trying to create in marriage as we relate to him who is other than us, just like we relate to our husbands who are other than us. And this is such an amazing picture of commitment to the commitment that God has for us, that it is something that doesn't change despite circumstances changing. That's why we say things like in sickness and in health, in wealth and in poverty, like that we are going to be together and we vow to stay together as, as a married couple. That this is a reflection of the commitment that God gives for us. And so our goal in marriage, if we are to be successful in it, is not happiness. It cannot be happiness. But instead, the real goal of marriage is to glorify God. And the really great thing is that no matter who your spouse is and what goals that they have, 
you are able to glorify God with your marriage, that is something that you can absolutely attain. So this is a, an important thing to think about marriage, that it's not about making us happy, but about painting a picture about who God is. The second lie that women believe about marriage is that it is my job to change my mate. Now, one of the things about relating to someone who is other than us is they do things differently than we are okay with. They're just different. And sometimes they do things differently even when we feel very strongly about something. Very early in my marriage to John, he was working on his dissertation. And this was vast, and it was big, and it was huge for our family. This was a document that was going to very much influence our family's future. And so the stakes were very high for this task to get accomplished. And sometimes he worked on a different time schedule for the dissertation, than I did and that I thought was okay and appropriate. And I, you know, wanted to help him along. And so I would, you know, bring it up and say, are you really sure you want to do that? Or do you think this would be a good time to work on your dissertation? And those sort of things that I tried to assume control by nagging. Now, this nagging was nothing more than a way for me to try to manage my feelings of discomfort. It was not helpful in the process at all. In fact, it communicated things to him, like that I didn't trust him to get it done and that I didn't think he was able to do it by himself, that were really very damaging to the whole process. And when I was trying to change him and assume control over this, I was creating a very difficult situation for us as a family to try to climb out of. What I found helped him more than anything was for me to communicate that I trusted him and that I respected his ability to take care of our family, for me to encourage him that he was doing a good job in it and that he was really able to get this thing done to, you know, take care of us. And, and that is something that is really counter-cultural. We absolutely get the message that if you want something done, you have to do it yourself. And if there's anything that is important, we need to gain some sort of control over it. And that is what we are doing when we are trying to change our mate. We're trying to assume control. And the truth is that for this picture of our relationship with God to be painted, that when I choose not to grasp at control, when, we, when I believe that something needs to be changed, it ultimately demonstrates our trust in God, even more than our tr necessarily our trust in our husband, but that we trust God to do the changing, to do the work that needs to be happening in our husband's hearts, that he, he is responsible to be the God of my husband, not me. And that's a really, really countercultural, really big thing for us to realize in our marriages. The third lie is that my husband is supposed to serve me. Now, our culture has a real hard time with this idea that things ought to be fair. That we get really stuck in this idea that I did this, 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 and this, and so I deserve this, 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 and this, with 
a lot of women sharing some of the financial load of the family, we get really huffy about this idea that that since we're doing this, the men should be, you know, doing their parts of the other things in the family. Now, I am not saying that, like, men should do nothing in a marriage. What I am saying is that it's very, very dangerous when we get the idea that we deserve things because of the things that we've done. That we have kind of a, a quid pro quo relationship with our husbands. Now, this is very, very dangerous because, again, our marriages are painting a picture of our relationships with God. And our relationship with God is absolutely not quid pro quo. It is absolutely not fair. Christianity is 100% not getting what we deserve. That we aren't getting what we deserve, but thank God we are getting what Christ deserves. And that is, that is huge. And when we understand that we are getting what Christ deserves, our actions and our service comes not in order to gain something, but as a reflection of our gratitude. And this is very, very important to portray to the world within our marriages. I talk a lot about, my t about this to my kids because they get very caught up in the idea of the unfairness of our household tasks. And they see how much they have to do of their chores or whatever and look at their siblings and they're like they're not doing that much I shouldn't have to do this much it's not fair and so I have to talk to them about we don't do things because they're fair we do our household tasks out of gratitude for what we have and when you transform your thinking about the different tasks in a marriage and the different tasks in a household from the idea that I, I do this and thus I deserve other stuff instead to I'm doing this out of thankfulness and joy that really changes the picture that we are painting that marriage very much is a picture of us giving 100% of ourselves, not, you know, everything being balanced, but by each, each side giving a hundred percent, kind of like Jesus gave his all for us, that we give all of ourselves to our spouse in service throughout the marriage. Now, I am very much, I very much appreciate some of the things that the author brought out in this chapter in marriage because some of these truths have been very very twisted through our society and through our selfishness in order to serve you know some people's best interest and so on page 170 she said that women was a woman was not made merely to help the man do whatever he wants to do we are not serving our husbands in order to facilitate selfishness. That we are serving our husbands, and sometimes the way we're serving them is in getting, giving something for them to, you know, butt up against, for um, a resistance that is what is necessary to cause change. And that can't be our primary goal in service. However, sometimes that is what we are doing. That we're not, we're not being loving when we are helping facilitate, you know, self-destruction. And we very much need to be asking God and inquiring of Him and making sure that our service 
is truly serving in love. The fourth lie that women believe about marriage is that if I submit to my husband, I'll be miserable. Now this idea of submission is a great concept that we've gotten some really messed up ideas about. Submission is saying that, you know, we recognize an authority and that there's an authority structure and in that authority structure there's also different responsibilities. And that's what it is. The lies that we believe about what submission is, is that submission means that one person is inferior. That's not true. Or that submission means that the wife is supposed to be a slave to the dictator husband. Or that submission means that I have no input at all into the decisions in our marriage. That I have no agency. Or submission means that he's always right and I'm ultimately always wrong. Or another big one is that it allows my submission allows my husband to do whatever he wants and I'm going to absorb all of the consequences. Now, let's think about this through the idea that submission in marriage is intended to paint a picture of our relationship with God. If any of these were true, that does not paint God in a very great light, does it? And so we need to start rethinking what submission is so that we can demonstrate this relationship that we have with God that our submission to our husbands paints this picture about how we ultimately are obedient to God and that he is ultimately responsible for the, our relationship and our well-being. To give an example about what submission is, Recently, I have been really struggling with the idea of getting on anxiety medicine. I would really love to just be able to manage my anxiety with good behaviors, with exercise, with getting the right amount of sleep, with doing different self-care. To You know, I'd really like to manage my anxiety that way. And my husband kept noticing that my anxiety wasn't getting better and wasn't getting better and wasn't getting better. And so he was encouraging me, Joe, it's time to get on medication again and try that form of intervention. And I was really resisting it because I ultimately am afraid of medicine and the things that that will do in my body and things that that will do in my relationships. And so I was very much resisting this idea and uh, God finally told me, Joe, this is a submission issue. This is a place where you need to defer to your husband's wisdom, that that's what submission is. That even though it is, you know, your body, he has been tasked with caring for your body. And he is using his you know, connection with God and his wisdom that he's had to give you this instruction. And so I have submitted to that. And I will see how this glorifies God. And I, I know that it has, it's freed me from this worry and from this, you know, being torn up inside about the idea of medicine because I can trust my husband and I can trust his authority for me and, and submit to this. This is what submission looks like. It doesn't, you know, look like getting beaten or those sort of things, but it, it looks like deferring uh, and yielding my will to someone else. And this is something that we absolutely need to practice as we are yielding our will over and over to God. 
The fifth lie that women believe about marriage is that if my husband is passive, I've got to take the initiative or nothing will get done. You know, once again, this is about control. So much about marriage is about yielding control because evidently we really need to get this idea across our heads. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways know him, and he will make your paths straight. Our understanding absolutely says, when you see a problem, you fix it. And so, if somebody else is slow to the problem, go ahead and fix it. And our God says something very different, that he says, trust me. And trusting God goes very, very counter to our urges. It, it's very much different than our own understanding. But it also allows God's glory to show through. You see, if, I'm, if I see something that I want my husband to do or to change, and if I'm pressuring him to do it and he does it, then all the glory really goes to me. But when I'm trusting God to, to change my husband's, to get things done if he wants to get it done, then the glory goes to him. And I get to see the way that God paints a picture that I might not have seen if I was forcing my own will upon it. The final lie that women believe about marriage is that there's no hope for my marriage. I think another one of the big lies here is that marriage should be easy. And if it's not easy, something is desperately broken. Well, you know, just like serving God should be easy, right? And living for God should be easy. But spoiler alert, it's not. And just like the reflection of our relationship with God, marriage takes a lot of effort. I like to use the analogy of the effort in marriage like the dishes. When you are living in a household... Dishes get dirty, and to wash them, it will take work. Now, if you don't feel like doing the dishes, and if you don't do the dishes, then you'll have dirty dishes, and then, you know, things can get crusted on, and, you know, maybe like really, really in there. And so when you go later to do it, it might take a lot more effort and a lot more work. And the more you let the work of the dishes pile up, the more work they'll be, it'll be. And the more hopeless it will feel that this task will ever get finished. I know that sometimes I come across household tasks that have gotten so very bad, I just really think it would be so much better if I could just throw all that stuff away and just start over. And I think often that is how people start looking at their marriage, as I just need to throw this all away and start over. And sometimes when I've looked at the different tasks that I've had, I felt like I didn't have the strength for them. Now, sure, I don't have the strength for all my laundry, but more importantly, when we're doing emotional work and relational work, often we feel like we, it's a lot of work and we don't have the strength for it. The amazing thing is that God has promised us in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. When your marriage looks like it is hopeless, don't put your hope in your own efforts. Don't put your hope in 
the way that you and your husband have worked in the past. Put your hope in the Lord. Let him renew your strength and see what he does. Because he is able to craft miracles in our lives. He's able to craft miracles in our relationships. And he is a glorious God. And when we hope in him, we are never disappointed. It is amazing what happens when we yield the control to God. When we let him be the focus and the goal of our marriage to see what he crafts in us. The amazing picture of the unending commitment that God makes for us is the sort of thing that can be beautifully shown in our human marriages as we are completely committed to someone who is so very other than us. 